A New Earth, Awakening to Your Life's Purpose, by Eckhart Tolle. Chapter 7, Excerpts. Finding Who You Truly Are. Know Tom, Know Thyself. These words were inscribed above the entrance to the Temple of Apollo at Delphi, site of the sacred oracle. In ancient Greece, people would visit the oracle, hoping to find out what destiny had in store for them or what course of action to take in a particular situation. It is likely that most visitors read those words as they entered the building without realizing that they pointed to a deeper truth than anything the oracle could possibly tell them. They may not have realized either, no matter how great a revelation or how accurate the information they received, it would ultimately prove to be of no avail, would not save them from further unhappiness and self-created suffering, if they failed to find the truth that is concealed in that injunction, know thyself. What these words imply is this. Before you ask any other question, first ask the most fundamental question of your life. Who am I? Unconscious people, and many remain unconscious, trapped in their egos throughout their lives, will quickly tell you who they are, their name, their occupation, their personal history, the shape or state of their body, and whatever else they identify with. Others may appear to be more evolved because they think of themselves as an immortal soul or divine spirit. But do they really know themselves, or have they just added some spiritual-sounding concepts to the content of their mind? Knowing yourself goes far deeper than the adoption of a set of ideas or beliefs. Spiritual ideas and beliefs may at best be helpful pointers, but in themselves they rarely have the power to dislodge the more firmly established core concepts of who you think you are, which are part of the conditioning of the human mind. Knowing yourself deeply has nothing to do whatever with whatever ideas are floating around in your mind. Knowing yourself is to be rooted in being, instead of lost in your mind. Who you think you are. Your sense of who you are determines what you perceive as your needs and what matters to you in life, and what matters to you will have the power to upset and disturb you. You can use this criterion to find out how deeply you know yourself. What matters to you is not necessarily what you say or believe, but what your actions and reactions reveal as important and serious to you. So you may want to ask yourself the question, what are the things that upset and disturb me? If small things have the power to disturb you, then who you think you are is exactly that, small. That will be your unconscious belief. What are the small things? Ultimately, all things are small things, because all things are transient. You might say, I know I am an immortal spirit, or I am tired of this mad world and peace is all I want, until the phone rings. Bad news. The stock market has collapsed. The deal may fall through. The car has been stolen. Your mother-in-law has arrived. The trip is canceled. The contract is broken. Your partner has left you. They demand more money. They say it's your fault. Suddenly there is a surge of anger, of anxiety. A harshness comes into your voice. I can't take any more of this. You accuse and blame, attack, defend or justify yourself, and it's all happening on autopilot. Something is obviously much more important to you now than the inner peace that a moment ago you said was all you wanted, and you're not an immortal spirit anymore either. The deal, the money, the contract, the loss or threat of loss are more important. To whom? To the immortal spirit that you said you are? No, to me, the small me that seeks security or fulfillment in things that are transient and gets anxious or angry because it fails to find it. Well, at least you, at least now you know who you really think you are. If peace is really what you want, then you will choose peace. If peace mattered to you more than anything else, and if you truly knew yourself to be spirit rather than a little me, 
you would remain non-reactive and absolutely alert when confronted with challenging people or situations. You would immediately accept the situation and thus become one with it rather than separate yourself from it. Then out of your alertness would come a response. Who you are, consciousness, not who you think you are, a small me, would be responding. It would be powerful and effective and it would make no person or situation into an enemy. The world always makes sure that you cannot fool yourself for long about who you really think you are by showing you what truly matters to you. How you react to people and situations, especially when challenges arise, is the best indicator of how deeply you know yourself. The more limited, the more narrowly egoic the view of yourself, the more you will see, focus on, and react to the egoic li limitations, the unconsciousness in others. Their faults, or what you perceive as their faults, become to you their identity. This means you will only see the ego in them and thus strengthen the ego in yourself. Instead of looking through the ego in others, you are looking at the ego. Who is looking at the ego? The ego in you. Very unconscious people experience their own ego through its reflection in others. When you realize that what you react to in others is also in you, and sometimes only in you, you begin to become aware of your own ego. At that stage, you may also realize that you were doing to others what you thought others were doing to you. You cease seeing yourself as a victim. You are not the ego, so when you become aware of the ego in you, it does not mean you know who you are. It means you know who you are not. But it is through knowing who you are not that the greatest obstacle to truly knowing yourself is removed. Nobody can tell you who you are. It would just be another concept, so it would not change you. Who you are requires no belief. In fact, every belief is an obstacle. It does not even require your realization since you already are who you are. But without realization, who you are does not shine forth in this world. It remains in the unmanifested, which is, of course, your true home. You are then like an apparently poor person who does not know he has a bank account with a hundred million dollars in it, and so his wealth remains an unexpressed potential. Abundance. Who you think you are is also intimately connected with how you see yourself treated by others. Many people complain that others do not treat them well enough. I don't get any respect, attention, recognition, acknowledgement, they say. I'm being taken for granted. When people are kind, they suspect hidden motives. Others want to manipulate me, take advantage of me. Nobody loves me. Who they think they are is this. I am a needy little me whose needs are not being met. This basic misperception of who they are creates dysfunction in all their relationships. They believe they have nothing to give and that the world or other people are withholding from them what they need. Their entire reality is based on an illusory sense of who they are. It sabotages situations, mars all relationships. If the thought of lack, whether it be money, recognition, or love, has become part of who you think you are, you will always experience lack. Rather than acknowledge the good that is already in your life, all you see is lack. Acknowledging the good that is already in your life is the foundation for all abundance. The fact is, whatever you think the world is withholding from you, you are withholding from the world. You are withholding it because deep down you think you are small and that you have nothing to give. Try this for a couple of weeks and see how it changes your reality. Whatever you think people are withholding from you, praise, appreciation, assistance, loving care, and so on, give it to them. You don't have it? Just act as if you had it and it will come. Then, soon after you start giving, you will start receiving. You cannot receive what you don't give. Outflow determines inflow. Whatever you think the world is withholding from you, you already have, 
but unless you allow it to flow out, you won't even know that you have it. This includes abundance. The law that outflow determines inflow is expressed by Jesus in this powerful image. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. The source of all abundance is not outside you. It is part of who you are. However, start by acknowledging and recognizing abundance without. See the fullness of life all around you, the warmth of the sun on your skin, the display of magnificent flowers outside a florist shop, biting into a succulent fruit, or getting soaked in an abundance of water falling from the sky. The fullness of life is there at every step. The acknowledgement of that abundance that is all around you awakens the dormant abundance within. Then let it flow out. When you smile at a stranger, there is already a minute outflow of energy. You become a giver. Ask yourself often, what can I give here? How can I be of service to this person or this situation? You don't need to own anything to feel abundant. Although if you feel abundant consistently, things will almost certainly come to you. Abundance comes only to those who already have it. It sounds almost unfair, but of course it isn't. It is a universal law. Both abundance and scarcity are inner states that manifest as your reality. Jesus puts it like this, For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Good and bad. At some point in their lives, most people become aware that there is not only birth, growth, success, good health, pleasure, and winning, but also loss, failure, sickness, old age, decay, pain, and death. Conventionally, these are labeled good and bad, order and disorder. The meaning of people's lives is usually associated with what they term the good, but the good is continually threatened by collapse, breakdown, disorder, threatened by meaninglessness and the bad, when explanations fail and life ceases to make sense. Sooner or later, disorder will erupt into everyone's life no matter how many insurance policies he or she has. It may come in the form of loss or accident, sickness, disability, old age, death. However, the eruption of disorder into a person's life and the resultant collapse of a mentally defined meaning can become the opening into a higher order. The wisdom of this world is folly with God, says the Bible. What is the wisdom of this world? The movement of thought and meaning that is defined exclusively by thought. Thinking isolates a situation or event and calls it good or bad as if it had a separate existence. Through excessive reliance on thinking, reality becomes fragmented. This fragmentation is an illusion, but it seems very real while you are trapped in it. And yet the universe is an indivisible whole in which all things are interconnected, in which nothing exists in isolation. The deeper interconnectedness of all things and events implies that the mental labels of good and bad are ultimately illusory. They always imply a limited perspective and so are true only relatively and temporarily. This is illustrated in the story of a wise man who won an expensive car in a lottery. His family and friends were very happy for him and came to celebrate. Isn't it great, they said? You are so lucky. The man smiled and said, maybe. For a few weeks, he enjoyed driving the car. Then one day, a drunken driver crashed into his new car at an intersection, and he ended up in the hospital with multiple injuries. His family and friends came to see him and said, that was really unfortunate. Again, the man smiled and said, maybe. While he was still in the hospital, one night there was a landslide and his house fell into the sea. Again, his friends came the next day and said, weren't you lucky to have been here in the hospital? Again, he said, maybe. The wise man's maybe signifies a refusal to judge anything that happens. 
Instead of judging what is, he accepts it and so enters into conscious alignment with the higher order. He knows that often it is impossible for the mind to understand what place or purpose a seemingly random event has in the tapestry of the whole. But there are no random events, nor are there events or things that exist by and for themselves in isolation. The atoms that make up your body were once forged inside stars, and the causes of even the smallest event are virtually infinite and connected with the whole in incomprehensible ways. If you wanted to trace back the cause of any event, you would have to go all the way back to the beginning of creation. The cosmos is not chaotic. The very word cosmos means order. But this is not an order of the human, excuse me, but this is not an order the human mind can ever comprehend, although it can sometimes glimpse it. Not minding what happens. J. Krishnamurti, a great Indian philosopher and spiritual teacher, spoke and traveled almost continuously all over the world for more than 50 years, attempting to convey through words, which are content, that which is beyond words, beyond content. At one of his talks in the later part of his life, he surprised his audience by asking, do you want to know my secret? Everyone became very alert. Many people in the audience had been coming to listen to him for 20 or 30 years and still failed to grasp the essence of his teaching. Finally, after all these years, the master would give them the key to understanding. This is my secret, he said. I don't mind what happens. He did not elaborate, and so I suspect most of his audience were even more perplexed than before. The implication of this simple statement, however, is profound. When I don't mind what happens, what does that imply? It implies that internally I am in alignment with what happens. What happens, of course, refers to the suchness of this moment, which is already which already always is as it is. <laughs> the suchness of this moment, which always already is as it is. It refers to content, the form that this moment, the only moment there ever is, takes. To be in alignment with what is means to be in a relationship of inner non-resistance with what happens. It means not to label it mentally as good or bad, but to let it be. Does this mean that you can no longer take action to bring about change in your life? On the contrary, when the basis for your actions is inner alignment with the present moment, your actions become empowered by the intelligence of life itself. The ego and the present moment. The most important, the primordial relationship in your life is your relationship with the now, or rather with whatever, whatever form the now takes. That is to say, what is or what happens. If your relationship with the now is dysfunctional, that dysfunction will be reflected in every relationship and every situation you encounter. The ego could be defined simply in this way, a dysfunctional relationship with the present moment. It is at this moment that you can decide what kind of relationship you want to have with the present moment. Once you have reached a certain level of consciousness, and if you are reading this, you almost certainly have, you are able to decide what kind of relationship you want to have with the present moment. Do I want the present moment to be my friend or my enemy? The present moment is inseparable from life, so you are really deciding what kind of relationship you want to have with life. Once you have decided that you want the present moment to be your friend, it is up to you to make the first move. Become friendly toward it. Welcome it, no matter in what disguise it comes, and soon you will see the results. Life becomes friendly toward you. People become helpful. Circumstances cooperative. One decision changes your entire reality, but that one decision you have to make again and again and again until it becomes natural to live in such a way. The decision to make the present moment into your friend is the end of the ego. 
the ego can never be in alignment with the present moment, which is to say, aligned with life, since its very nature compels it to ignore, resist, or devalue the now. Time is what the ego lives on. The stronger the ego, the more time takes over your life. Almost every thought you think is then concerned with past or future, and your sense of self depends on the past for your identity and on the future for its fulfillment. Fear, anxiety, expectation, regret, guilt, anger are the dysfunctions of the time-bound state of consciousness. There are three ways in which the ego will treat the present moment, as a means to an end, as an obstacle, or as an enemy. Let us look at them in turn so that when this pattern operates in you, you can recognize it and decide again. To the ego, the present moment is at best only useful as a means to an end. It gets you to some future moment that is considered more important, even though the future never comes except as the present moment and is therefore never more than a thought in your head. In other words, you are never fully here because you are always busy trying to get elsewhere. When this pattern becomes more pronounced, and this is very common, the present moment is regarded and treated as if it were an obstacle to be overcome. This is where impatience, frustration, and stress arise, and in our culture, it is many people's everyday reality, their normal state. Life, which is now, is seen as the problem, and you come to inhabit a world of problems that all need to be solved before you can be happy, fulfilled, or really start living, or so you think. The problem is, for every problem that is solved, another one pops up. As long as the present moment is seen as an obstacle, there can be no end to problems. I'll be whatever you want me to be, says life or the now. I'll treat you the way you treat me. If you see me as a problem, I will be a problem to you. If you treat me as an obstacle, I will be an obstacle. At worst, and this is also very common, the present moment is treated as if it were an enemy. When you hate what you were doing, complain about your surroundings, curse things that are happening or have happened, or when your internal dialogue consists of shoulds and shouldn'ts, of blaming and accusing, then you are arguing with what is, arguing with that which is already the case. You are making life into an enemy, and life says, war is what you want, and war is what you get. External reality, which always reflects back to your inner state, is then experienced as hostile. A vital question to ask yourself frequently is, what is my relationship with the present moment? Then become alert to find out the answer. Am I treating the now as no more than a means to an end? Do I see it as an obstacle? Am I making it into an enemy? Since the present moment is all you ever have, since life is inseparable from the now, what the question really means is, what is my relationship with life? This question is an excellent way of unmasking the ego in you and bringing you into the state of presence. Although the question doesn't embody the absolute truth, ultimately, I and the present moment are one, it is a useful pointer in the right direction. Ask yourself it often until you don't need it anymore. How do you go beyond a dysfunctional relationship with the present moment? The most important thing is to see it in yourself, in your thoughts and actions. In the moment of seeing, of noticing that your relationship with the now is dysfunctional, you are present. The seeing is the arising presence. The moment you see the dysfunction, it begins to dissolve. Some people laugh out loud when they see this. With the seeing comes the power of choice. The choice of saying yes to the now, of making it into your friend. The Dreamer and the Dream Non-resistance is the key to the greatest power in the universe. Through it, consciousness or spirit is freed from its imprisonment in form. Inner non-resistance to form, whatever is or happens, is a denial of the absolute reality of form. 
Resistance makes the world and the things of the world appear more real, more solid, and more lasting than they are, including your own form identity, the ego. It endows the world and the ego with a heaviness and with an absolute importance that makes you take yourself and the world very seriously. The play of form is then misperceived as a struggle for survival, and when that is your perception, it becomes your reality. The many things that happen, the many forms that life takes on, are of an ephemeral nature. They are all fleeting. Things, bodies, and egos, events, situations, thoughts, emotions, desires, ambitions, fears, drama. They come, pretend to be all important, and before you know it, they are gone, dissolved into the nothingness out of which they came. Were they ever real? Were they ever more than a dream, the dream of form? When we wake up in the morning, the night's dream dissolves and we say, oh, it was only a dream, it wasn't real. But something in the dream must have been real, otherwise it could not be. When death approaches, we may look back on our life and wonder if it was just another dream. Even now you may look back on last year's vacation or yesterday's drama and see that it is very similar to last night's dream. There is the dream and there's the dreamer of the dream. The dream is a short-lived play of forms. It is the world, relatively real, but not absolutely real. Then there is the dreamer, the absolute reality in which the forms come and go. The dreamer is not the person. The person is part of the dream. The dreamer is the substratum in which the dream appears, that which makes the dream possible. It is the absolute behind the relative, the timeless behind time, the consciousness in and behind form. The dreamer is consciousness itself, who you are. To awaken within the dream is our purpose now. When we are awake within the dream, the ego-created earth drama comes to an end and a more benign and wondrous dream arises. This is the new earth. The joy of being. Unhappiness or negativity is a disease on our planet. What pollution is on the outer level is negativity on the inner. It is everywhere, not just in places where people don't have enough, but even more so where they have more than enough. Is that surprising? No, the affluent world is even more deeply identified with form, more lost in content and more trapped in ego. People disbelieve themselves to be dependent on what happens for their happiness, that is to say, dependent on form. They don't realize that what happens is the most unstable thing in the universe. It changes constantly. They look upon the present moment as either marred by something that has happened or shouldn't have, or as deficient because of something that has not happened but should have. And so they miss the deeper perfection that is inherent in life itself a perfection that is always already here, that lies beyond what is happening or not happening, beyond form. Accept the present moment and find the perfection that is deeper than any form and untouched by time. The joy of being, which is the only true happiness, cannot come to you through any form, possession, achievement, person or event, through anything that happens. That joy cannot come to you, ever. It emanates from the formless dimension within you, from consciousness itself, and thus is one with who you are. Allowing the diminishment of the ego. The ego is always on guard against any kind of perceived diminishment. Automatic ego repair mechanisms come into effect to restore the mental form of me, when someone blames or criticizes me, that to the ego is a diminishment of self, and it will immediately attempt to repair its diminished sense of self through self-justification, defense, or blaming. Whether the other person is right or wrong is irrelevant to the ego. It is much more interested in self-preservation than in the truth. This is the preservation of the psychological form of me, 
even such a normal thing as shouting something back when another driver calls you an idiot is an automatic and unconscious ego repair mechanism. One of the most common ego repair mechanisms is anger, which causes a temporary but huge ego inflation. All repair mechanisms make perfect sense to the ego, but are actually dysfunctional. Those that are most extreme in their dysfunction are physical violence and self-delusion in the form of grandiose fantasies. A powerful spiritual practice is consciously to allow the diminishment of ego when it happens without attempting to restore it. I recommend that you experiment with this from time to time. For example, when someone criticizes you, blames you, or calls you names, instead of immediately retaliating or defending yourself, do nothing. Allow the self-image to remain diminished and become alert to what that feels like deep inside you. For a few seconds, it may feel uncomfortable, as if you had shrunk in size. Then you may sense an inner spaciousness that feels intensely alive. You haven't been diminished at all. In fact, you have expanded. You may then come to an amazing realization. When you are seemingly diminished in some way and remain in absolute non-reaction, not just externally, but also internally, you realize that nothing real has been diminished, that through becoming less, you become more. When you no longer defend or attempt to strengthen the form of yourself, you step out of identification with form, with mental self-image. Through becoming less in the ego's perception, you in fact undergo an expansion and make room for being to come forward. True power, who you are beyond form, can then shine through the apparently weakened form. This is what Jesus means when he says, deny yourself or turn the other cheek. This does not mean, of course, that you invite abuse or turn yourself into a victim of unconscious people. Sometimes a situation may demand that you tell someone to back off in no uncertain terms. Without egoic defensiveness, there will be power behind your words, yet no reactive force. If necessary, you can also say no to someone firmly and clearly, and it will be what I call a high-quality no that is free of all negativity. If you are content with being nobody in particular, content not to stand out, you align yourself with the power of the universe. What looks like weakness to the ego is in fact the only true strength. This spiritual truth is diametrically opposed to the values of our contemporary culture and the way that it conditions people to behave. Instead of trying to be a mountain, teaches the ancient Tao Te Ching, be the valley of the universe. In this way, you are restored to wholeness, and so all things will come to you. Similarly, Jesus, in one of his parables, teaches that when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Another aspect of this practice is to refrain from attempting to strengthen the self by showing off, wanting to stand out, be special, make an impression, or demand attention. It may include occasionally refraining from expressing your opinion when everybody is expressing his or hers, and seeing what that feels like. As without, so within. When you look up at the clear sky at night, you may easily realize a truth at once, utterly simple and extraordinarily profound. What is it that you see? The moon, planets, stars, the luminous band of the Milky Way, perhaps a comet, or even the neighboring Andromeda galaxy two million light years away. Yes, but if you simplify even more, what do you see? Objects floating in space. So what does the universe consist of? Objects and space. If you don't become speechless when looking out onto space on a clear night, you are not really looking, not aware of the totality of what is there. 
you are probably only looking at the objects and perhaps seeking to name them. If you have ever experienced a sense of awe when looking into space, perhaps even felt a deep reverence in the face of this incomprehensible mystery, it means you must have relinquished for a moment your desire to explain and label and have become aware not only of the objects in space, but of the infinite depth of space itself. You must have become still enough inside to notice the vastness in which these countless worlds exist. The feeling of awe is not derived from the fact that there are billions of worlds out there, but the depth that contains them all. You cannot see space, of course, nor can you hear, touch, taste, or smell it. So how do you know it exists? This logical sounding question already contains a fundamental error. The essence of space is no thingness. So it doesn't exist in the normal sense of the word. Only things, forms, exist. Even calling it space can be misleading because by naming it, you make it into an object. Let us put it like this. There is something within you that has an affinity with space. That is why you can be aware of it. Aware of it? That's not totally true either because how can you be aware of space if there is nothing to be aware of? The answer is both simple and profound. When you are aware of space, you are not really aware of anything except awareness itself, the inner space of consciousness. Through you, the universe is becoming aware of itself. When the eye finds nothing to see, that no-thingness is perceived as space. When the ear finds nothing to hear, that no-thingness is perceived as stillness. When the senses, which are designed to perceive form, meet an absence of form, the formless consciousness that lies behind perception and makes all perception, all experience possible, is no longer obscured by form. When you contemplate the unfathomable depth of space or listen to the silence in the early hours just before sunrise, something within you resonates with it as if in recognition. You then sense the vast depth of space as your own depth and you know that precious stillness that has no form to be more deeply who you are than any of the things that make up the content of your life. The Upanishads, the ancient scriptures of India, point to the same truth with these words. What cannot be seen with the eye, but that whereby the eye can see, know that alone to be Brahman, the spirit, and not what people here adore. What cannot be heard with the ear, but that whereby the ear can hear, know that alone to be Brahman, the spirit, and not what people here adore. What cannot be thought with the mind, but that whereby the mind can think, know that alone to be Brahman, the spirit, and not what people here adore. God, the scripture is saying, is formless consciousness and the essence of who you are. Everything else is form, is what people here adore. The twofold reality of the universe, which consists of things and space, thingness and no thingness, is also your own. A sane, balanced, and fruitful human life is a dance between the two dimensions that make up reality, form and space. Most people are so identified with the dimension of form, with sense perceptions, thoughts, and emotions, that the vital hidden half is missing from their lives. Their identification with form keeps them trapped in ego. What you see, hear, feel, touch, or think about is only one half of reality, so to speak. It is form. In the teaching of Jesus, it is simply called the world. And the other dimension is the kingdom of heaven or eternal life. Just as space enables all things to exist, and just as without silence there could be no sound, you would not exist without the vital formless dimension that is the essence of who you are. We could say God if the word had not been so misused. I prefer to call it being. Being is prior to existence. 
Existence is form, content, what happens. Existence is the foreground of life. Being is the background, as it were. The collective disease of humanity is that people are so engrossed in what happens, so hypnotized by the world of fluctuating forms, so absorbed in the content of their lives, they have forgotten the essence, that which is beyond content, beyond form, beyond thought. They are so consumed by time that they have forgotten eternity, which is their origin, their home, their destiny. Eternity is the living reality of who you are. Some years ago, when visiting China, I came upon a stupa on a mountaintop near Guilin. It had writing embossed in gold on it, and I asked my Chinese host what it meant. It means Buddha, he said. Why are there two characters rather than one, I asked. One, he explained, means man. The other means no, and the two together means Buddha. I stood there in awe. The character for Buddha already contained the whole teaching of the Buddha, and for those who have eyes to see, the secret of life. Here are the two dimensions that make up reality, thingness and no-thingness, form and the denial of form, which is the recognition that form is not who you are. End of chapter.